welcome to Unchain Skid, Unchain Your Mind. Today we're going to talk about how money is created. All the references and the books that I read and all that stuff and a few advertisement stuff at the very end. Let's just get into it and make this happen. Okay, we're going to be referring our discussion to the U.S. monetary system because most Western democracies do it in a very similar way, so we'll just restrict our discussion to that. The first thing that uh, we should get uh, out of the way in terms of what we're talking about is we're not actually talking about money. We're talking about currency. Now, there's a lot of sophistry about this. What is actually currency versus money? Without going into huge details and huge arguments, and we can have another video about this later, currency we use to transfer value around, money actually keeps its value. All the stuff that we're talking about here is ways of trading value, but it doesn't actually keep value over time. So we're talking about actually how currency is created. The second thing that we need to get out of the way is that there's actually four distinct types of things that represent US dollar currency. And you have to understand all four. They're kind of interchangeable, but kind of not, and it depends on who you are. But they're all denominated in US dollars, and when you're talking about US dollars, you can actually talk about all of these four things. The first one is fiat currency. You recognize this? It's these things, dollar bills or coins. This is what we use in circulation to move value around. So you're all familiar with that one. Second one, bank deposits. When you go to your bank and you look on your balance, this is what the bank deposit is, represents US dollars in your bank account. We'll get more to that later. What you probably don't know about is central bank reserves. Okay, we will talk about these a lot more later, but these are created by the Fed. And we'll talk a lot more about the Fed later too. Fourth one, treasury securities. Again, we'll talk more about this later. These are created by the US Treasury. We'll talk more later. Okay, so let's start from what we know. We know this. You have this in your pocket and you're like, huh, I want to go take it to the bank and I want to put it in the bank and I want to have it in my bank account and that way when I go to the store I can just buy stuff using my debit card. Something we're all familiar with. This is fiat currency. You take it to your bank. You put it in your bank. And they sit there and they type on their little computer and they turn it into a bank deposit. Now what you should realize is that they take this fiat currency along with a bunch of other stuff and a whole lot of magic happens with that. They make investments, they do things with it, they give out loans and all kinds of stuff that's a subject for a different video. What you should understand is that your bank deposit is completely separated from this. This bank deposit, which is your numbers that are just sitting there on a screen, is just numbers on their ledger. It means nothing more than that. So, for example, let's say that you take the money, the currency, in your bank deposit, represented by your ATM card, and you go to, the to a store and you want to buy something. You go to the store. You have your ATM card. You go, I want to buy something. So you want to pick up something, whatever it is, and you want to give them currency. Can you give them your bank deposit? Well, you can if you and the store have the same bank. If you and the store have the same bank, then in order to make this transaction happen, all the bank does is it decreases your bank deposit by however much this thing costs, and it increases their bank deposit by however much that costs. Boom, done. The problem comes if the store banks at bank two because this bank deposit is just a number on a ledger here. How can that possibly be translated over to here? You wonder, well, how the heck did this ever happen before? Well, what used to happen before is if you wanted to move some money from here to here by buying something from someone else, these guys would have some gold or some silver, and they would get it in a chuck wagon and move it over to here, and then 
they could credit this guy's account. But we don't work that way anymore. We want to, things to be safe, efficient, and fast. So what the banks use to transfer over this money is central bank reserves. With your Interact card there, you decide, I want to purchase this from the store. What actually happens behind the scene is your bank gets the request for you to buy something from the store which banks at bank number two. What bank number one does is it decreases your bank deposit, the amount which was the cost of what you bought. What the bank, this bank number one does is it sends over to bank number two the equivalent amount in central bank reserves. The central bank reserves show up over here and bank two says, cool, I've got something that represents this value and they increase the bank deposit of the store by the same amount. In this way, what you bought from your de bank deposit ends up in their bank deposit, but it has to be mediated by something else. And that something else is the central bank reserves, which lets the banks move money between themselves. Could they use these fiat currency? Sure, they could. They could take a big truck full of bills for all the people that are doing this and move them back and forth, but that's just impractical. So they use central bank reserves now. Okay. Where do those central bank reserves come from? What, what is this thing called central bank? In fact, where does even this, this fiat currency come from? In the US, it comes from the Fed. And the Fed stands for Federal Reserve Bank. which is an amazing example of branding because it is neither federal nor a bank. In fact, this is a privately owned company, a company that has shareholders, private shareholders. It doesn't trade, uh, it doesn't trade uh, the stock doesn't trade on any uh, stock exchange, privately held, and you're never gonna figure out who they are because they like keeping themselves hidden. But they have a company, and this company called the Federal Reserve Bank has been chartered by the US government to create the US monetary system. I'm not even kind of kidding. It's a private company that makes the US monetary system for the government. What do they do? Well, they do a lot of stuff. But for the purpose of this discussion, they make central bank reserves. As you just saw with the last example, We need something in order to let banks and other entities too, we'll get to that, trade amongst themselves. So the Fed acts as a bank for all the other banks. So the Fed is the bank for banks, all right? So each bank, each chartered bank in uh, the US has an account at the Fed, very similar to the bank account that you have at your bank. The Fed manages that account for them, so what, when the banks have to change money between themselves, the Fed just changes the balance in their accounts the same way that that one example we had where you and the store had the same bank, they could just change the balances. In this case, the Fed can change the balance of the amount of central bank reserves that goes between the banks. Now just bear with me for a second here. The Fed sets up a system of accounting and in that system of accounting, they have an account for every bank. That account has numbers in it, which represents the amount of central bank reserves, which represents currency. The banks trade amongst themselves by changing the amount of those numbers. If this bank owes this bank some, it sends a request in, the Fed debits this one and increments this one on the ledger. Central bank reserves are money, which really means currency, for the banks to be able to trade between themselves so they don't have to use gold and silver and stuff like that anymore. That 
is the primary purpose of the Fed with respect to this video. They do a bunch of other stuff. You with me so far? Okay. Okay, now we're ready to start the business of creating some money. But first of all, let me introduce you to this other entity called the U.S. Treasury. These are the guys who take in the money for the country and spend the money for the country. Well, they disperse it to the different government departments that spend the money. So when you pay U.S. income tax, it goes into here. Corporate tax goes into here. All the Treasury does is collects all that money eventually. Then it disperses it as per the politicians uh, dictates, how, however Congress decides, however uh, the budget goes, and it goes to the various government departments to pay for all the government programs. So the U.S. Treasury is the one that keeps track of all the money going in and out of the government. Fair enough? Now, you might have noticed lately that not as much comes in as goes out. In other words, all the politicians are spending more money than they're bringing in. So they're lying to us constantly. And why does this happen? Because we like being lied to and we keep voting in the ones that lie the best, is what it is. Bottom line though is this has to be balanced out. If the treasury spends more than it brings in, that's called the deficit. And what do you do about a deficit if you're the US treasury? Easy, you write IOUs. You take a little something, like a piece of paper or a number on a screen, and you say, hey, I'll tell you what, we're the U.S. government. If you lend us some money, we'll pay you back that money, and after a certain term, with interest. So it sounds like a good deal, doesn't it? You get interest back on whatever principle you put in there, and it's backed by the U.S. government. U.S. government, which has nukes, and one of the biggest, well, the biggest industrial uh, base right now. So U.S. Treasury Securities, which is what these IOUs are called, are sought the world over because they're a really cool place to invest money in. But all they are backed by is the promise of the U.S. government to pay them back. It literally is Bubba coming up to you and going, hey, let me 20 bucks and I'll pay you back 21 bucks later next week. All you got to go on is that Bubba's actually going to do it. So Treasury Securities is just Bubba's promise to pay back money later with interest. That's all it's based on. Is it, uh, can you think of it as coming out of thin air? Sure, if Bubba's promise is thin air. Treasury Securities. Now that we know this, we can figure out how to create money. Okay, let's create some money. So way over there at the treasury, they say, who wants to buy some treasury securities? And the bank says, hey, I do, because that sounds like a great investment for now. So the treasury sells treasury securities and the bank pays for them. Now, what do you think the bank pays for them in? What do all the banks use to pay for stuff because of the way the system's set up? Central bank reserves. I mean, you don't think they still use gold, do you? All right. So the bank is holding the treasury securities, and that's nice. They pay a little bit of interest, but they don't really help the bank to do what it needs to do. So it turns out that one of the biggest buyers of treasury securities from the bank is the Fed. So the Fed buys the treasury securities from the bank.
and pays for them with central bank reserves. Now, let's pause for a second because that's a little tough to figure out. So you might ask yourself, where did these central bank reserves come from in the first place that the bank had to pay for the treasury securities? That's like asking how you start an engine. It, the system's already in place. How we get it going is a different question and subject for a different video. Suffice it to say that those central bank reserves were part of the bank's balance sheet and it used it to start with. Okay, so beyond the scope of this video. But for here, these central bank reserves are different from those ones. And why is that? Because when the Fed creates central bank reserves, it bases them off the asset that it buys or the loan that it gives out. In other words, it's backed by something. This central bank reserve here that the bank now owns is redeemable for this treasury security. In other words, these central bank reserves can be traded in for this treasury security. And you say to yourself, well, okay, so this was made up out of thin air, it was just a promise. And this is a promise to give a promise back. Yep, that's exactly right, okay? However, these central bank reserves, once they're over here in the bank, can be used in the banking system to trade everything. That's how you make a banking system. Now we'll get down to how this comes down to you in a second, but that's how money gets created in the system. Who wins here? Well, over here, Treasury wins because now the deficit's been paid for. Because all these central bank reserves come in here, the Treasury can disperse that to the different government departments who have bank accounts. Central bank reserves end up going back to the banks, which ends up in all the employees and the contractors' bank accounts. So the Treasury can pay for the deficit because it traded off these Treasury securities. The bank doesn't want to keep the Treasury securities, so the Fed buys them. Now you might ask, why doesn't the Fed just buy from the Treasury directly? Not allowed to by law. They're supposed to stay separate. Hmm. However, they have this big open market shell game, basically. So really what ends up happening is the securities flow to the Fed, although there are other places that the Treasury securities end up, like China, but we'll get to that later. And inevitably, central bank reserves come back to the Treasury to spend on things. So the Treasury wins. The bank wins because as all this happens, they take their cut and the Fed wins because over here, they've managed to create money and make the money system go. Now, who loses in all this? You, my friend, because these things here and these things here all have interest owing on them. So somebody has to pay the interest on this debt. That somebody is you as you pay taxes to the treasury. So everybody's happy in this whole big thing, except you. Okay, now let's say how the bank can take its central bank reserves and put more money into the economy. Remember, we've been talking about how money is created, in which case we really mean currency here. Now the bank has a whole bunch of central bank reserves sitting there, it is true. However, most of the money that is moving around in the economy is not coming from central bank reserves in that big shell game that we watched. It's actually made by the bank. We'll talk about how the bank makes more money. Let's say that you come into the bank and you want to take out a $100 loan. Bank says, awesome, 
does a credit check on you, says, hey, you're a kind of guy who's probably going to pay this back. Let's see what we can do. So they give you the loan and what happens is this is what your balance sheet looks like. Your assets now show a hundred dollar bank deposit. but also a loan from the bank. For $100. On the bank side of the ledger, their asset is the loan because it's paying them interest from you. All right. And their liability is the $100 bank deposit. Yours. Now, you might think that this bank deposit that ended up in here is based on something, that they have to keep some money in a vault or something that, that makes this work. They don't. They type some numbers on a computer and this money comes into existence. Now, you can use this, move it to buy something, which, you know, has to happen with the central bank reserves changing and all that. But this money just pops into existence. How most money is created is on the computers of the banks in the nation, just this way, all right? Is there some constraints to this system? Yes. <clears throat> First thing the banks have to remain is solvent. This means that when you tally up all the assets and liabilities for the bank, there's more assets than liabilities. If they have more liabilities than assets, they're bankrupt. So at all times, they have to be taken care of to make sure that they analyze these loans correctly so that they get paid back. If people default on these loans, the bank could very quickly end up insolvent. Not just loans, but investments. If investments go bad, oh, I don't know, like mortgage-backed securities, we'll talk about that later, the bank could become insolvent. So they have to be careful with these loans to maintain their solvency. The other thing they have to maintain is liquid. If I take, or you take your $100 bank deposit that came from that loan and then go buy something at the store, remember the bank is just going to take this balance down, but they have to transfer over central bank reserves to the store's bank, okay? So stuff is coming in and out of banks all the time. And they have to make sure they have enough central bank reserves to make sure that whatever's coming in and out and out, if there's an imbalance by a little bit, the central bank reserves uh, can, can cover that. Now, do they need $100 worth of uh, central bank reserves to cover $100 of bank deposits? No, they don't. How much do they need? By law, it used to be about 10%. Nowadays, no kidding, it's zero. Now, no bank should be 0% for central bank reserves for covering stuff to maintain liquidity, so they maintain a bit. But by law, it's actually not much. So the fact that they can make all these bank deposits based on a very small amount of reserves, a fraction of the reserves, is what's called fractional reserve banking. So based on the central bank reserves that the bank has that came from that shell game that we talked about, they can lend out a lot more money. That's why most of the money created in the system is created by banks using the fractional reserve system. I'm not kidding, that's the way it works. So, to review, simple, simple system. Treasury creates treasury securities, sells the treasury securities to a bank. Bank pays for it with central bank reserves that it had already. Bank sells treasury securities to the Fed. Fed pays for those treasury securities with more central bank reserves, which are backed by those very same treasury securities. 
So money comes out of thin air here, gets traded to the bank for a promise to pay back something else that's based on thin air, goes to the Fed, which pays for it again with something based on thin air. Promise for thin air, promise to redeem a promise on thin air. And as long as these central bank reserves are sitting here in the bank, the money system can work because then the bank can lend out bank deposits to me and you. That's all there is to it. A couple little added points. These treasury securities are what represents the debt of the US government. All these outstanding treasury securities are promises for the US government to pay back that money. That's the federal debt. You've probably heard of quantitative easing. Quantitative easing is the Fed buying treasury securities. Like I say, they can't do it directly. They have to do it on the open market, but the more they buy up treasury securities, a lot of stuff happens. But that's quantitative easing discussion for another video. Lastly, because the treasury ends up with all these central bank reserves, which lets them pay for things in the real economy, all of a sudden there's a lot of money, because this is all denominated in US dollars, that's paying for stuff in the economy. But the economy, what you can buy is just the goods and services that exist. So if all you have is a finite number of goods and services, but you've expanded the money supply, eventually the amount of money you spend on each good and service is going to be bigger. That's inflation. Again, topic for another discussion. Hope this has helped you understand a little bit of how money works. Unchain your mind to figure out how money is created and so that you can, the more you know about what's going on in the world, the more you can navigate it. Thanks to Joseph Wang who wrote this book called Central Banking 101. I don't know Joseph, I have no deal with him whatsoever. However, I read this book and wow, is it ever illuminating. Although it's like taking an undergrad course. Joseph, if you ever watch this video, Give me a call, man. I would love to talk to you. Other references in the, uh, in the low bar and at the end of the video. Hope you enjoyed this. See you on the next one.